And what do you do after you've hit it big in crypto? In this video, I'm gonna walk through the 10 essential steps that you need to take after a major liquidity event in crypto, whether you're cashing out or thinking long-term, holding your assets, these steps will help you protect, grow, and preserve your wealth. So let's dive in. All right, first things first, we have to establish a family compass, charter, or constitution. So you might be thinking, what is that? How does that work? It's really the long-term vision for your wealth, where you want to go. You're deciding if you want to do lifestyle stuff, you know, enjoy it while it's here. You're not really leaving anything to anybody else. Maybe you don't have kids or beneficiaries or people you want to take care of, and you want to maximize lifestyle. Maybe you want to set up a legacy, right? You want to have the family office. You want this to go on for generations, the next hundred years. What's that going to look like? How are you going to build out? What's the mission of your family? All those things. Or maybe you have philanthropic interests, okay? Maybe you want to give back. You have something on your heart that you've had an experience in your life or a loved one go through that you don't want other people to deal with and you want to set up a foundation. You want to make donations. You want to drive benefits for people so that they don't have to experience those things. So that's kind of high level. What does each one of these include? Well, you're going to look at core values. What are the principles that guide your financial decisions? What's your North Star? You have a mission statement similar here. What's the purpose of your wealth? Is it for security or philanthropic purposes, lifestyle, legacy, all those things I mentioned before? And what are your goals? You're going to determine milestones like funding education, supporting charitable causes, or growing the investments at a certain rate. And then you're going to look at roles and responsibilities. Make sure everyone in your family knows who they are, where they sit, what their part is in managing the wealth. So this step ensures that every decision you make is aligned with a long-term vision. Without it, wealth can quickly become confusing and a conflict and a problem instead of a blessing. So after you've set that up, number one, family constitution, North Star, know where you're headed, you're going to engage with a tax professional. <laughs> so if you've cashed out, it's likely that you've triggered a taxable event and you're going to figure out how to mitigate those taxes. We're coming out of the end of the year here in 2024. We're in November. You've got a couple months left. You know, if you do have something this year, you're going to have to do something quick to be able to offset those capital gains, whether the short term or long term, depending on how long you've held the asset. So here's the deal. The tax man is going to come knock on your door. Um, we're looking at some stuff here from Trump. Maybe he takes away capital gains on crypto that doesn't exist yet. Um, or, you know, maybe there's some other laws or regulations that come in around this stuff. Until those things happen, we have to operate under the pretense they're not. And the existing law and infrastructure is the way it's going to go. So irrespective, you're going to reach out to counsel for a tax advisor. Uh, we have many of those people at Digital Ascension Group, uh, Digital Family Office. So love to help you there if that's something you're interested in. Um, but anyway, you want to understand your liabilities. So what do I owe? Why do I owe it? How can we mitigate it? You're going to optimize those tax strategies. You're going to look at the tools uh, to harvest losses or charitable contributions or depreciation or setting up insurance policies. There's a lot of different ways that you can you know, skin that cat, but you're going to figure that out. You're going to set aside enough cash to be able to pay the tax bill. So you're not caught off guard. Okay. I see so many people that win the lottery or come into a bunch of money in crypto. Um, you have famous cases where people evaded taxes and then were caught and they had to pay millions of dollars because of the penalties and fees. And you don't want to be in that position. So trust me, uh, it's not an area of do it yourself. You want to get a professional and you want to get help to avoid the future headaches. Number three, you're going to want to build a liquidity buffer. Okay. So again, you know, taxes aside, you're going to want some living expenses and you're going to want to have an emergency fund and some of those things. This is something we talk about just in general for most people as a good practice. You want to make sure that you have, you know, three to 12 months worth of expenses set aside somewhere, money market, earning interest, uh, but easily accessible. It's liquid. Okay. Uh, and maybe that's a line of credit against your crypto. We'll talk about that later, but you want to make sure that you have access to those tools because you don't know what you're going to do yet. How are you going to invest the money to be able to generate cash flow? Did you quit your job? I know a lot of people <laughs> right off the jump quit their job. I don't recommend that either. I recommend hanging out for a little while, structuring these things, getting situated, getting used to having that money, and then making that transition. So if it's something that you're like immediately going to do, I, I'm not saying don't do it, that it's not possible that you shouldn't. Some circumstances demand that, but 
you know, just be calculated in the way that you're thinking about that. So you're going to think about this emergency fund as your financial safety net, whether it, whether the market goes up or takes a big downturn unexpectedly, uh, you don't have to worry about the volatility and you have that stuff set aside so that you can make sure your bills are paid and um, you're taken care of and your family's taken care of. Up next, after you have that, you know, situated, you got your family compass, within how you define your investment strategy, you might look at some diversification to invest in things that are uncorrelated digital assets, especially to hedge against the volatility here, right? Before uh, constraints change, you know, we're, we're hopeful that we're going to get some regulation and utility and things are going to be more stable and developed. Uh, but as long as there's speculation in the space, we're going to have huge swings. And so having some, you know, investments outside the scope of crypto and non-correlated asset classes could be a really good idea. The way that I like to think about this is the same way that Kevin O'Leary does. Um, you should only have to get wealthy, wealthy once, okay? You don't want to lose it all, betting it all again. You, you've already done the hard work in making a good choice, making a good investment, seeing it appreciate. You don't want to squander it and watch it go back down, okay? And we've seen a lot of people do that in crypto. So if you can pull some liquidity off the table, you might look at real estate. Uh, you can use cost seg on properties and pull that depreciation forward and offset some of the tax implications that you might have. Uh, you might want to look at stocks or bonds or ETFs. Uh, some ways to get, you know, um, diversification and maybe across a wider swath of some of these things. Most of the family offices that I've interacted with and deal with, they're looking at, you know, somewhere between 15 and 25% exposure to equities, just public markets. And a lot of that is in ETFs. It's hard to pick winners in specific stocks. Um, but if you have, you know, you're investing in the S&P 500, over time, it's done 10% almost every single year uh, over the long term. I, I'm bullish on the U.S. economy. I think now that we have Trump in here and some other things are coming down the pike, uh, we might see a pullback in traditional stocks for a period of time. But I think the next decade uh, and further out, things are looking good. They're looking up. So past the short-term volatility over the longer term time horizon, I do think we continue higher. Uh, you've also got bonds and treasuries and, and corporate debt, um, corporate credit. There's, there's a bunch of different areas that you can diversify into. Kevin O'Leary, the way he thinks about this is he never puts more than 20% of his wealth in any one given asset class and never more than 5% of his wealth in one investment. And I think that's a great way or framework to look at it to make sure that you're not betting too much on one horse, unless you really know, you know, diversification is a hedge against ignorance. Uh, I will say that uh, if you understand a space, and a lot of family offices do, they, they keep the core of how they built their wealth as the main focus, and they may diversify within that ecosystem or whatever that investment thesis is. And they might have a few ancillary things, but a lot of what they do is continue to double down on what they understand. So a lot of people here in crypto may end up continuing to do the same thing. And that's why we're going to go to number five, which is considering holding your crypto as a long-term wealth driver. We've seen so many people get wealthy with Bitcoin, right? They were confident in the beginning. They made investments at a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, a hundred dollars, three hundred dollars, three thousand dollars. All of those people have done extremely well over the last decade here. And, you know, depending on what crypto you're in, um, my preference is XRP. But, you know, we've got other ones. We've got HBAR, we've got XLM, we've got XDC, we've got ADA. Like, there's a ton of different assets out there that I think will have long-term utility and use case that will drive their price and adoption. And so if you're going to hang on to it, you can borrow against it, or you can put it into other things. So you've got, like I said, the exponential growth, historical growth of some of these assets that have shown that they're a great place to hold your wealth. You've got passive income opportunities with staking, if that's native to that network or protocol. Uh, or the asset that you're holding. Um, some of the people that, again, I deal with XRP, uh, AMMs, liquidity pools, lending, and other DeFi that's being built out on that one network. And other, there's some other strategies uh, that you can use. You know, you have, you've got perps, you've got, um, if you're outside the U.S., and you have uh, options plays for, you know, covered calls and puts. And, and there's a lot of different investment strategies if people are going to continue to hold the asset to be able to earn yield in the asset or in dollars, depending on what they want. And then you've got the fact that this is generational wealth, right? Like people that hold large amounts of gold or treasuries or other things, and they're passing that down to their kids and their grandkids. 
if it continues at the same rate of adoption and growth over time, I mean, that's huge. You're, you're handing them the golden goose that keeps laying the golden eggs, right? So I'm not always a proponent of selling off your crypto. I think that there are great strategies for doing that. I think diversification is key. Uh, if you are ignorant or this is your first time, you don't want to mess it up. Um, work with professionals in that category also. I'll just say that. Uh, but aside from those things, if we continue with the volatility here, you're going to have to have a stomach. If people that have held Bitcoin for a long time, they're okay with, you know, a 70% pullback in the value of their asset. They continue to buy more during that period and it goes up again. Maybe they sell some off. It's a roller coaster. Uh, but over the long term, it's up and to the right. You do you. Diversification, good. Holding the asset, good. Especially if you have a high understanding of what this asset is and what it's going to do. But the sixth thing that we're going to talk about is setting up a family office. So what is a family office? A family office is uh, for people that are north of eight figures or range um, in that area. You know, So $100 million or more most times for a single family office or a multifamily office. Uh, a digital family office, and we work with people that are somewhere between 20 and 50 million, right? So if you're north of that, you might be a single family office. Uh, you're going to have an investment strategy, tax planning, estate planning, lifestyle management, all of that, all those professionals are going to work for you, and they're going to put your assets to work and make sure that you're earning a yield on them and be able to pay for all these things that you might want to deal with. The main thing that I would look at here, especially in the beginning, is estate planning, uh, mitigating risk, uh, and protecting your wealth, and we'll talk about that for step number seven. So, what does that look like? Do you want to get your assets into a trust? Do they need to be moved into an LLC? That's something we do for a lot of our clients proactively. Gives them a lot of flexibility with a tax code, and on the other side of a price appreciation, allows them to easily move those assets into a trust. You you want the LLC outside the trust so that you can harvest the taxes and pay that, and basically funnel the assets into the trust over time through an interesting strategy we have there. Uh, you might look at an asset protection trust, a spendthrift uh, trust, a dynasty trust, offshore trust. There's all different types of trusts that you might want to use uh, in this instance. But again, it needs to go back to your compass, your constitution. What's your North Star? How do you want to protect and structure your wealth to be in alignment with that? And so I would bring all that into the conversation with the tax planners, with the estate planning, with the investment strategy. And all of that's going to help you orchestrate the entities and how you've set things up within the scope of your family office to make sure that it's in alignment with that and you're going to be successful over the long term with whatever your goals are. So on the digital assets in particular, okay, so you've made your money in Bitcoin, ETH, XRP, Solana, whatever it was. I would really advise getting that into institutional custody. I know a lot of people are not your keys, not your crypto. These are still your keys. You still have to sign on the transactions in institutional custody. If it's inside of a trust, if you're going to have a distribution trustee that's going to sign off on that and the wealth manager, right? So it's multi-factor. It's very difficult to steal or, you know, impersonate all those people to be able to remove assets or do something uh, with them that the individual does not want to do. Uh, Digital Wealth Partners partners with Anchorage for that service, uh, multi, multi-sig, multi and they have uh, sharded keys across HSMs that store the assets and the keys, and it's extremely, extremely airtight uh, for security. And, and because of that, it has insurance on it, crime insurance in particular, that covers the assets. Uh, and then you want to look at other types of insurance. Do you want to set up uh, and safeguard uh, your assets inside of an insurance policy? Here in the U.S., uh, you can have Financial products and insurance policies can mix together. Uh, you have a unique product called PPLI or private placement life insurance. It's something that we do uh, for our clients for anything above the gift tax threshold that they you know, don't want to move into a trust uh, or pay the taxes on it for doing so. And so you want to look at that. We have a lot of providers we work with specific to crypto for insurance, do species. If you want to add more insurance onto your accounts, uh, we can do that as well. So all those things, you're mitigating risk, you're setting up your estate, you're putting things in place to be able to offset uh, taxes and make sure things are structured in a way that people can't get them or take them from you in a lawsuit. And then the last thing for tr- step seven here uh, in protecting your wealth, mitigating risk, you're going to do continuous reviews of all these things. Is what I'm using the absolute best in the industry? 
uh, for whatever area, the insurance or the custody or uh, each one of these advisors, right? You're going to assessment on an annual basis and make sure that everything's on the up and up and everybody's got your best interest at heart. Um, we welcome that, right? We want to make sure that we're providing the most value that we can for our clients. And so with that, you just want to make sure that you're doing those regular reviews, uh, checking your investments, making sure that they're keeping up with what you anticipated and they're in the areas that you thought they were going to be. And again, you can put governance in and, and all that stuff to make sure that that's the case. But this is kind of the order of things that you want to think through. Uh, and then aside from that, like I talked about early on, you may have you know lifestyle, you might have legacy, and you might have philanthropic interest, or you could have all three. I'm not saying you have to pick any one. It could be a blend of all three, whatever it is. A lot of people may have some philanthropic interest. And if you do, you might set up a donor advised fund or a private foundation or charitable uh, remainder trust. There's a lot of different products that you can structure and use to really, really make an impact for people. Um, and we have people that can help do all of those things, set them up. And um, it's a nice tax write off too. And you get to help people. So, uh, and I think as, you know, your cup flows over and you have more than you need, um, it's nice to be able to give back to other people and help others uh, from how you've been blessed. So uh, on the other side of, of philanthropy and, and what that may look like, again, you know, lifestyle legacy planning is kind of the next stop here. Uh, once you have your estate established for yourself, am I going to set up insurance policies for my kids' kids or my grandkids? Are we going to use a generational skipping trust? Are we going to set up wills? Uh, is there... What's the governance structure for our family look like, right? Uh, in that, you know, are there stipulations on who has access to the money, when, and if they have to do certain things to get access to the money? Um, what are you going to pay for? Education, homes, cars? You're going to supplement income? Uh, like I said, insurance policies earlier on. There's a lot that goes into that. And it, like I said, it's a little bit further down the line. But once you have things established, you've got it set up, that you're making money, and, and you're thinking about, Kids, 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 kids. If you really do, you know, Kevin O'Leary has life insurance policies set up for the next five generations, just to go back to Kevin. He's done really well, right? So if you do really well, then it might be something, it's definitely something you're going to want to consider. And then the last thing, number 10 here, you want to make sure that you're staying educated. You're staying up on the space. You're understanding how things are moving forward. Um, you're, again, you want to have a good enough understanding about all of these things so that you can have a conversation with professionals and nobody's pulling wool over your eyes. I've seen a lot of people over the years work with people and get real comfortable and just assume everything's going, going along and it's not. So, um, not to say don't trust people, just, you know, trust, but verify, right? That's the whole point of blockchain and crypto. Uh, but you want to stay educated. So as things come about, DeFi protocols come up, uh, new things happen on networks, different types of strategies, different types of trust and estate planning, uh, laws change. All these things can affect uh, you and your money and your estate and your family. So you want to make sure that you're staying up on that, especially, you know, if you don't have to work that day job anymore, you got a lot of time on your hands, go uh, sip some Mai Tais on the beach and read some books. So some of the ways that you can do that, again, uh, just continue education through courses, books, events, going, and, and you can write those things off if they're part of your business. I'm just saying, uh, keep an eye out on market trends and regulation changes, uh, and then adapt your strategy to emerging new opportunities. A lot of people that are invested in this asset class may be looking at AI. You might be looking at, um, some of the other convergence of different technologies that create solutions in different industries. You've got 3d printing, there's, there's so many things that I think are going to happen over the next decade here with the advent of AI and the acceleration of a lot of innovation in multiple spaces. Um, it's going to be interesting and hard to keep up. So the educational piece is huge for this. And especially if you're going to be actively managing your investments, which, you know, a lot of the patriarchs or matriarchs are people that make their money do uh, inside of a family office, then you definitely want to be stay sharp and be able to do those things. So if you're doing that, you're going to be able to stay informed. You're going to make better decisions. So there you have it. There's the 10 things that you need to do uh, if you do have a liquidity event in crypto. You want to set up that family charter or compass. You want to talk with a tax professional. You want to set up that liquidity buffer. You want to look at diversification. You want to potentially hold your crypto for the long-term driver of your wealth. You want to set up a family office. 
You want to look to protect your wealth and mitigate risk. You want to set up, uh, potentially set up philanthropic interest, legacy planning, and then the last things to stay educated. So whether you're cashing out, holding long-term, building a family legacy, or you have philanthropic interest, the key is to act with intent and strategy. So if you found this video helpful, again, as always, please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and let me know in the comments, which of these steps are you focused on? And until next time, stay curious and stay ahead of the curve.